We're kicking off a new series today, and the series is called The Seven Words of Praise. But just to kind of talk about our culture and who we are as a church, and I can't do it every week, and so that would get boring And if you heard the same seven sermons all the time. But we are unapologetic in the fact that we are a spirit-filled praising church. And uh, that's who we are as the body of Christ here in this house is we are uh, spirit filled. We're led by the spirit of God, empowered by the spirit of God, and we are praising church. We believe in praising God and and we praise God boisterously. And so I want to do this series and talk a little bit about that and why we do those things uh, in the house of God. So if you have a Bible, an iPhone, an iPad, a droid, however you get the Bible, uh, turn with me to the book of Psalm uh, and chapter 107. And that while they were singing the song, um, there is power in the name of Jesus. And when Caleb broke out uh, into, I see chains falling, it reminded me of a text because um, our key verse is found in Psalm 107, verse 31. But if you read back to verse 1 uh, in Psalm 107, uh, there is six different ways that the, the psalmist is writing to us, kind of encouraging us, imploring us to praise God. And he begins just in in Psalm 107, verse 1. It's not in the notes or in the screen. He just says, oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And then verse 2, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Then in verse 8, oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Then you get to verse 14. And it says, and he brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and broke their chains in pieces. When you get into the presence of God, it will break chains. When you get out of the presence of God, you'll be in chains. Matter of fact, you go look at Jude and there's only one chapter in Jude. It's one chapter. It says those angels that lost their first estate, meaning they're no longer in the presence of God, they were bound. And if you want to be bound, you get out of the presence of God. But if you want to be free, you get into the presence of God. And praise is that is the difference right there. And you get into the presence of God, you begin to praise God and chains will fall. Then verse 15 of Psalm 107, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Then verse 21, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And then our key verse, which is at the top of your worship God, which I've already read to you uh, four other times. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And this is a, a series just called the seven words of praise. I grew up uh, in church. I was two years old uh, when my, my father uh, committed his life to Jesus Christ. And before that, my, my grandfather on the other side. Um, so my family has been in church all of my life. All of my memories is I went to church. I went to church Sunday morning, 10 o'clock. Sunday night, 6 o'clock. Tuesday night, 7 o'clock. Thursday night, I tried to turn it into nap time because it was Bible study, but we went to church on Thursday night at 7 o'clock. And then we had prayer meetings. Anybody else have that kind of a schedule growing up, man? You went to church. Your parents had a drug problem. They drug you to church all the time. Just... Where are we going? We're going to church. We were just at church. Uh, we would get out of church at, you know, from the 10 o'clock service on Sunday morning. Church would get out at like noon, and choir practice was at 4.30. Like, what did you do all day? We had roast mashed potatoes. We, we stuffed ourselves full of carbs. We took a nap, and then we got up and went to church. That's what we did. We went to church. So I grew up in it, and it was, and so I grew up in an environment, uh, and my, the environment I grew up uh, is a little bit different than the environment here at SIWC. I grew up in, a, in, a, in sometimes a crazy environment in church. Church got crazy. People were praising God. And many of the events that happened while I was in church, uh, there, there's some incredible stories. Like you get with me personally, I can tell you some church stories. Some of them will make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Some of them you'll shake your head like, I can't believe that. And I say, yes, it happened. Uh, I, 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 there's, there's funny stories that happen in church. I, I heard uh, and watched a lot of things happen in church. Uh, one of the guys probably, I could probably tell the most stories about, his name is not Don Ziss. And Don was a full-blooded Jew who came to know Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And he never got over it. 
He praised God. His family disowned him. They wouldn't even allow him to be buried uh, with the family because he claimed Jesus to be the Messiah over his life. But Don never got over Jesus being the Lord over his life. And he was a praising guy. He, he would take his shoes off and clap with his shoes. He'd do all kinds of things. See, I told you. He'd be like, oh, it yes, it happened. Matter of fact, there's a, a whole chapter of a book written about Don Ziss where if you all remember the old hymnal, I'll Fly Away. Uh, old, old Don, we used to have a platform about this tall and we had banisters up on it. And old Don took off running the aisles one day and he come right up on the stage, got up on the banister and just tried to fly away right in the middle of church service. Yeah, it happened. I grew up with some stuff in church. It wasn't until I was about 32 years old that I realized that many of the people in my life, past and present, really didn't understand praise. We, we, were, we caught praise, but we were never taught praise. We, we caught it. We saw things that happened in church. We're like, oh, that's, oh, everybody's raising their hands. We'll raise our hands. We didn't even know why we were raising our hands. They're clapping. Why are we clapping? Why are we doing these things? And it, it's easy to catch something but not even realize why you're doing it. Does it have any biblical significance? Is it biblically mandated? Why are we doing this? Or is that guy just like totally out of control? And Don admitted later, he said he got so caught up in the moment he thought he could fly. And when he belly flopped in the front, he realized he could not. <laughs> I realized that some of the stuff I witnessed was just a little overboard. And Many people don't realize this, but praise is about giving attention to Jesus. And I want to be careful with this because I don't want anybody to think I'm trying to get people to not praise God. The whole point of this series is to get you to praise God. Matter of fact, we, we have a rule here in production and those types of things. When we watch videotapes of our services, we never critique a move of God. We never pull a musician in or a singer in and say, man, what were you thinking at this moment? Because the minute that you start critiquing that kind of stuff, then the next time God moves on you, that's what's going to be in the back of your mind. And you'll quench the Holy Spirit within you because of what somebody said about you. Be careful making, some, making fun of people who praise God. Because they may stop praising God and then you'll wish they were praising God. And then in their minds, they're thinking, well, what's everybody thinking about me? But I think some things that will go on in church, and, and here's where the line is, is when the attention is moved away from Jesus and the attention is placed on you, you've crossed the line. Because the attention and the praise is all to go to Jesus. And when you begin to bring attention to yourself, you're bringing glory and honor to you or you're causing a distraction to the point where the attention is now on you. You are robbing Jesus of praise. And our job is to give Jesus praise. And our job is to get people's eyes fixed upon Jesus. And I, I believe that the church needs to be a place of praise. And Jesus is worth every bit of praise that we can give to him. I'm a firm believer in the following words of Jesus. And Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 37. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first commandment. So let me ask you something. In the first 25 minutes of our church service today, did you praise God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, and all of your strength? I think sometimes we're, we're afraid to because, like, we're the 11 o'clock crowd. The 11 o'clock crowd is a little tamer than the 9 o'clock crowd. So I got to fit in. And to fit in, I'm just going to kind of go with the flow of the service, even though I came to get something from Jesus. And I got to worship Jesus with all of my heart, all of my mind, all of my soul, and all my strength. And I think we should do that. Every ounce of energy that we have. When I get done preaching at the 1 o'clock, I'm exhausted. Why? I'm giving it everything that I've got. I'm putting every ounce of energy that I have into the, every church service that we get into because that's the commandment. Then in verse 39, he says, and here's another one, to love your neighbor as yourself. And, then, and I think a lot of times we think our neighbor is like the person that lives next door to us. But our neighbor is any person that we come in contact with. And if I'm to love my neighbor 
as myself. And I, and I love Jesus. I want my neighbor to love Jesus. And if I want to see Jesus, I want my neighbor to see Jesus. I don't want my neighbor to see me. I want my neighbor to see Jesus. I want my neighbor to know who Jesus is. I don't want him to know me. I want him to know Jesus. So I got to live my life in every aspect of my life. When, I, when I'm at home in energy, when I'm here at the church in Aaron, I have to live my life and I'm living for Jesus with all of my heart, all of my mind, all of my soul, all of my strength. And then I love my neighbor as myself. So if I want to love Jesus. I want my neighbor to love Jesus. And I don't want to be so crazy about Jesus that my neighbor doesn't want to know Jesus. That makes sense? I don't want to do anything that would cause my, I don't want my life to be a stumbling block for anybody else to come to know Jesus. You're like, I don't want to be like Jason. No, I want my neighbors to go, man, that guy walks with Jesus. He talks with Jesus. He praises Jesus. He lives for Jesus. He loves Jesus. And if, man, if that guy can do it, I can do it. And I think sometimes the, the reputation of the church is people are like, I love Jesus. <laughs> I just don't know about the people. And we've got to serve the Lord with everything we've got so that it makes it appealing for other people to want to fall in love with Jesus. And in all my years in church, leading church now, I've never once been embarrassed by the Holy Spirit. Not one time has the Holy Spirit ever caused me to do something that would embarrass Him or bring shame to me. And we need to live our lives like that. And so after all these years of kind of being in church, watching church, and people watching in church, and don't judge me, you all watch people too, watching people in church, and I begin a journey in my own life a few years ago, I wanted to know why we praise God. Why do we do this? What, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to do this? And I often you kind of take for granted the upbringing that I had as a child and growing up in my, in my teenage years that, man, I, I caught a lot about praise. I caught it. I, I watched it happen. And so I'm like, man, that's how you do it. This is what's going on. And I believe that praise should be caught. But I also believe that praise should be taught. Why are we doing this? Because I think if it's only caught and we're only watching people, you know, and that's how we do it. I think we'll pray, we won't praise God when things are bad in our life. Because most people praise God when things are great and amazing. But when you teach praise, that praise has nothing to do with your natural circumstances. Praise has nothing to do with what you're going through. Praise has nothing to do with how you feel. Praise has nothing to do with the song that's being played. Praise has nothing to do with how bright it is or not bright in the church service. It has nothing to do with this place. Praise has everything to do with who Jesus is. And when we realize that, man, it doesn't matter how I feel. It doesn't matter what I'm going through. It doesn't matter what, what's happening in my life. Jesus is always worthy of praise. And so we have got to not only catch it, but we have to teach it. And we have to, pray, we have to praise God in such a way that another generation coming up will praise God. If we stop praising God, the next generation never will praise God. They do have to catch it, but we also have to teach it. And we need to raise up a generation that is a praising generation. And it is my desire as pastor, I want to bring up a generation of believers that are absolutely unashamed in their praise. That this generation that is coming up, they will praise God for what he has done, what he is doing, and what he's getting ready to do in their lives. That they will praise God every aspect of their lives. And if we don't do that, if we don't praise God, then they're never going to know how to praise God. I mean, I look at my children, I wonder, are my children going to have the stories, good, bad, indifferent, are they going to have the stories to tell about church that I have? Are they going to go, man, you know, when I went to church and I watched this guy get healed or I watched this person get delivered, are, are my children going to have those types of stories to tell their children down the road? Because I have those stories that while, yes, there were times that things got crazy and things were a little out there, but there were also the times where I watched people who walked in lame and crippled and walked out completely healed. I watched people who come in blind, walk out. I watched a dead boy get raised up to life. I watched all kinds of things happen like that in church are my children going to have those types of stories to tell their children that hey you know your grandpa was a praising guy and you look at your family if you don't praise God your children won't praise God and if we as God's people don't praise God the world won't even know how to praise God they'll just come into church and go with the flow of it and it's time that we raised up an entire generation that will praise God and so the psalmist wrote in Psalm 107 he said oh that men 
would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Now, all the women think, man, that's amazing. All the men got to praise God. And men should praise the Lord. But that word man, men there is not talking about a, a male. It's talking about mankind. That mankind would praise the Lord. What are we praising the Lord for? We're praising the Lord for his goodness. And for his mighty works to the children of men. So he's saying, hey, whether you're old, whether you're young, whether this is your first time in church, or this is your millionth time in church. And I think that covers just about everybody. If you've been in church more than a million years, you need a new name. We'll call you Methuselah. Hey, if you don't know who that is, that was the oldest man in the Bible. He lived a long time. Matter of fact, we could call you Enoch or some one of those guys who didn't die. But it doesn't matter where you find yourself on the spectrum, we're required to praise God. And then the psalmist takes it a step further as he ends out the chapter from verse 31 to the end of the chapter. He gives 18 reasons why we should praise God. And some of them go like this. You praise him for his goodness. You praise him for his wonderful works. You praise him that he can put rivers in the wilderness. He can, he can do all these things. He makes fruitful land. He does, uh, turns dry ground into water springs. He makes a place for the hungry to live. He gives the ability to produce a city. He causes his people to be able to sow. And when they sow, it's into fruit fruitful fields. They have fruitful vines. And for all of us parents, he blesses them with children. Now you may not feel like praising God over your child right now, but they are a blessing of the Lord and you ought to praise God for them that he blesses you with children. He increases their cattle. He blesses the poor. He increases him like a flock. We shall be able to see it and rejoice. And we praise God for the loving kindness of God in our lives. He gives 18 reasons. And so basically what he's saying, no matter where you find yourself in life and no matter what you're going through in life, there is a reason to praise God in your life. There's something that you can find to praise God for. We have a tremendous amount of things to praise God for. So let me ask you a question. Remember, you're in church, which means you need to be honest. If you're on a teeter-totter, negative over here and positive and good things over here, which side do you fall on? The negative or the positive good things? Most people fall onto the negative side. And I know you don't want to be honest right now, so I'll just talk about me. Hey, Melissa's not here to defend herself. My kids could do a hundred things and do them right. And I can walk through the house and I see a spot in the floor and I'm like, how could you sweep the whole house and not see that spot? And they're like, but yeah, I did over this, I did this, I did this. I'm like, I'm not, no, I don't care. I'm, I'm talking about this right here. And I go so overboard on the negative that they don't even think I even seen the positive. Anybody else ever like that? I think we do that with God, right? You know, we, we, we fail to see the goodness of God. We feel like, man, I, you know, man, God, you know, you haven't done this for me yet. So I'm not going to praise you. Because I'm focusing on the one why or what if in my life that hasn't happened. And I've forgotten about the million things that you've already done today that are good. And we fall over to the negative side. So we stop praising God because some prayer didn't get answered. Or God didn't show up the way we thought God should show up. And we forget that, man, we woke up this morning. And this is debatable in my life. In my right mind. I woke up this morning knowing who I am, knowing where I'm going, knowing what I'm supposed to do. So all these things that God is doing in my life. And then you get caught up in that one thing that you think God failed you on. And so instead of praising God for the thousand things he's done good for you, you're over here pouting over the one thing he didn't do. When in fact, the thing that he didn't do is probably going to wind up being a blessing in your life down the road anyway, when you get a different perspective on it. And I see so many people like, I don't have anything to praise God over. Really? You wouldn't have a right mind if it wasn't for the grace of God in your life. You wouldn't be successful in your business if it wasn't for God. You wouldn't know how to put your shoes on if it wasn't for God. Just ask Nebuchadnezzar. If God takes his hand off of you, you don't even know that you're a human being in your life. So it is the grace of God in our lives. And so people say, I don't know if I need to praise God. You have something to praise God for in your life. And stop looking at the one thing that you think, oh, you held out on me, God. But look at the 
with all the things that God has blessed you with in your life. If God does something for you, you ought to praise God in your life. See, when, the reason why praise is in a battle right now is praise is a battle of the natural man versus the spiritual man. The natural man, by nature, is a selfish guy. The spiritual man, by nature, clings to God. So let me, let me just give you a, an idea of this, what's in our nature as a spiritual human being. Uh, the second time we ever flew to New York City, um, we had a couple of rough flights, in, in the, and Zoe uh, sat next to me because we were on Southwest, and they heard you like cattle. And so Zoe sat next to me, and Morgan sat next to Melissa, and the flight re- was starting to really get bumpy, I mean, like right out of St. Louis. And Zoe, without even thinking, she didn't ask for permission. She didn't tap me on the shoulder and say, Dad, nothing. She just reached over, and then we hit a bump, and she put both arms around my arm and just squeezed really tight. See, it was in her nature that when things got rough and storms were all around her, it was in her nature to reach out to the one person that she has faith in and that she has trust in. Because she's still at the age that daddy can do anything. So she just reaches out, she just grabs a hold of me. And she's like, because as long as she was holding on to me, she felt safe. My dad's next to me. It's going to be all right. And I just pat her on the leg. So it's in her nature as a child that when storms hit, she lets go of everything else and grabs onto her father. That's the nature of a child. The nature of a father, and now let me explain it like this to you. So M- 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 Melissa was pregnant for Zoe, and it was in December. So we were just a few weeks into the pregnancy. And we were getting ready to go to Christmas to my family. And Melissa calls me. And I'm expecting a honey to-do list. I worked in the city. We lived in the middle of nowhere. And so I was expecting, hey, you need to pick this up, pick this up, pick this up before you come home. Because we're packing up to go to the parents' house. Instead, when I answered the phone, Melissa's voice was very different. And she said, I think we lost the baby. My nature, even though I never had held Zoe, we hadn't even named her Zoe. My nature was to be protective. She was not, you know, birthed yet, but the dad nature rose up in me that I wanted to protect my child. Even when she couldn't reach out to me, I wanted to reach out to her. Even when she couldn't get to where I was, I wanted to get to where she was. And I wanted to protect her. So the nature of a child is that when they're in trouble, they want to reach out to their father, their, their parents. And man, I need you right now. And the nature of the father is, I want to protect you. I want to help you. I want to move you through this. I know, you know there's something happening and I want to get involved in it to fix what's going on in life. And so when we are spiritually born again, it is our nature. That when storms of life hit us, that we reach out to the one that we have put our trust in and our faith in. And we just want to latch on to him. And we say, we just, we're just so childlike in our faith. Man, when, when something happens, we just drop everything and we run to Jesus and we just wrap our arms around him. And his nature is, whether, whether you're trying to get to him or not, he's wanting to jump in and he's wanting to fix it. He's wanting to take care of you. He wants to calm the storm. He wants to do all that stuff. But then we get to be like a teenager, spiritually speaking, and we don't think our parents can do anything. And so when the storms of life hit, people ask you, how you doing? Instead of dropping everything and saying, man, I'm in the storm of my life and latching onto Jesus, we say, I'm fine. I got it. I'm all good. Nothing in my life right now. Yet you know deep down in your life, there's something going on. And what you're doing is you're refusing to praise because praise is giving glory and honor to Jesus. And what you're saying is, I'm going to hang on to this instead of letting go and latching on to Jesus and giving him the honor of taking care of what's going on in my life. I'm going to be selfish and I'm going to hang on it and I'm going to take care of it myself. 
Selfishness is the sinful nature of a man. It is the nature of Lucifer. I mean, Lucifer committed three sins. He had pride, self-exaltation, and rebellion. It's all about him. I'm not going to praise you anymore. I want all the praise to myself. I fixed this myself. I did it myself. I may have been scared to death, but man, I made it through myself. I did it all by myself. It's all about self. That's the nature of men. And the further you get away from God, the less you want to rely on God, and the more you want to rely on yourself. And you look at our nation right now. Our nation is turning to itself. The further we get from God as a society, we see the very nature that God put inside of us to reach out to God. We're seeing that turned around. And Paul wrote to Timothy, and he said, this is the nature that's going to happen. And you, when you see this nature happening in men, you'll recognize that you are in the end times. He said it like this. He said, men will be lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. There will be an unnatural affection. Selfishness will abound. Paul's telling Timothy, he said, listen, when these types of behaviors begin to happen, it is a sure sign of the end times that men will do all that they can to promote themselves, to gain for themselves, to, to achieve for themselves. So men will go after, they will attain, then they'll retain, and then they'll wind up complaining that they don't have enough for themselves. They want to give no glory to God. They don't want to count on God. They don't want God to bless them. They don't want God... I can do it all by myself. My friend, you cannot do anything on your own. You need the grace of God in your life. And it's time for us, the believers. I'm not talking to people in the world. I'm talking about the believers. We're hanging on to the power of self. And when you hang on to the power of self, you are no longer praising God. It is time for us to let go of all the things that are in our lives and latch on to the one in whom we have believed in and that we were persuaded that he was able to take care of any Anything in our lives. That's the just, I mean, you get down to the brass tacks, that's what praise is. Many people don't want to praise God because I don't want to give up myself. I don't want my reputation tarnished. I don't want anybody to say anything about me. I don't want anybody to think differently of me. Man, if I throw up my hands right now, what will people say? You are guarding self instead of latching on to Jesus. You're trying to maintain your honor at the expense of giving him honor. We need to get praise back into our lives. Paul said, listen, this selfishness is going to abound. He said, listen, when those types of people, when they portray those behaviors, they will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And no doubt that each generation prior to me could say of the generation after them that that's the generation Paul was talking about. The baby boomers could say it of the generation Xers. The generation Xers would say of the generation Y, you're the most selfish generation I've ever seen. And now the generation Y has another generation behind them. Generation Y is looking at the millennial generation and saying, you're the most selfish generation I've ever seen. The fact is, any generation without God or any person without God is going to have a selfish nature. It's just a, a desire within us as humans to blame somebody else and tell them, you're selfish. You're, no, no, you're the selfish one. It's within all of us in our natural man to be selfish. This is what the temptation of our day is. Is to let go of self and to latch on to God. And if it is not in your nature right now that when God enters the room to praise him, let me just use an old line. You need to check yourself before you wreck yourself. You're on a collusion course. And when God walks into the room, your hands ought to go wrap around him and adore him and honor him and praise him. And it ought not to matter who's around you because Jesus is in the room. And all of our attention is supposed to be on him. And if everybody in the church would throw their attention upon him, then nobody would be looking around at you trying to judge how you praise. See, I desire a church that the only oddballs in the house are those who are not praising. Those church people. 
They're fair, you see. And they want you to see how fair you are. I didn't come here to see how fair you are. I came here to see Jesus. I need Jesus in my life. I need to let go of the things that I'm trying to hold on to and latch on to Jesus. And maybe this will help you, maybe not, maybe just help me. I don't know why God finds it so humorous to make me live out what I'm getting ready to preach. I mean, I thought I was doing really well with the things that have transpired in my life over the last three months. I thought I was doing amazing, man. Melissa would tell me, hey, you know, you know, how you doing? And I'd say, I'm good. I'm over it. I'm over it. Now I found in the last three weeks I don't want to get up out of bed. I'm an early riser. Five, five in the morning is waking up late for me. This morning I set my alarm for 6.05. Hit the snooze button three times to the point where my dog was like, get out of bed, dude. <laughs> You're waking me up with that hitting the snooze button. And here I am trying to hang on to my own emotions, my own pain, my own grief, my own sorrow, my own pity. I'm going to make this all by myself. And this morning, I said, well, I had to shake myself. Now, wait a second. I need to let go of this. And I need to latch on to Jesus. I need to get a hold of Jesus in my life. I'm trying to say I'm fine self. Jason's good. Jason's a strong guy. Ain't nobody going to see me cry. I'm going to handle this differently than everybody else. Look at me. I'm real. Yeah, no, no. I need to hand it over to Jesus. And the only way Jesus can take anything out of my hand is if I let go of it. And the only way I'm going to let go of it is if I latch on to him. And if I have a hold of Jesus, then I can't hold on to anything else in my life. If I'm holding on to Jesus, then I can't hold on to the depression. If I'm holding on to Jesus, then I can't hold on to the grief of my life. If I hold on to Jesus, I'm holding on to the right things and I'm letting go of the other things. And there's many of you in this room, man, you're like, no, I, I, I've got to know. I don't, I don't want to praise God. And man, what will everybody think? No, you know what people think? They think, man, that person really in love with Jesus. Yes. You have to, you're faced with the same decision that I am. Will you allow self to destroy you? Or will you say, look, I don't want to be selfish. Instead, I want to run to Jesus. James said of this. Maybe he said, I'm drawn away from God. James said it like this in James chapter 1 verse 14. He said, you are drawn away. You are pulled away by your own lust. By your own selfish, sinful desires. You're pulled away. God doesn't pull away from you. You pull away from God. So if lust and selfishness pulls you away, what draws you close? I mean, he, the scripture says, if you'll draw close to him... He'll draw close to you. Praise is like a magnet. You begin to praise God, and all of a sudden, the atmosphere shifts. Something changes completely there. I mean, he's been there all along. I mean, that's why the kind of the understanding when David said, Oh, come and magnify the Lord with me. I mean, the reality is you can't make God any bigger than he is. But the reality is that when you begin to praise God and you begin to draw close to him, you start realizing, my goodness, God really is that good. God really is that big. And so before your attention was on the, whatever it is that you were hanging on to, but when you let go of that and you latched on to him, you're like, my goodness, he really is a good God. He really is a blessing God. He's a healing God. He's a delivering God. He's a way making God. He's a peace speaking God. He's a joy giving God. He was that all along. It's just that now you got a hold of him and you're seeing him how he really is Amen. lust draws us away but praise draws us close praise is the antidote for selfishness when you begin to praise it's no longer about you it's about him and we've been born again and so it is in our nature to want to praise God scripture gives an interesting text in Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It's a total change in character of Jesus. When Jesus come into that city, into Jerusalem, it says that the people, the multitude of the disciples in Luke 19 verses 35 through 37, that the multitude of disciples, they begin to rejoice and they begin to praise God. 
They were throwing their clothes on the coat. They, they said Jesus on it. They spread their clothes on the road. I mean, if that happened in church today, people are like, what in the world is going on here? People were praising Jesus. But it was a change in, in the way in which Jesus normally had operated. See, normally, up until this point, when Jesus encountered anyone, either through a mighty miracle or calling them to be his disciple or tell him, hey, take up your cross and follow. He would downplay the praise. He'd heal them and he'd say, don't tell anybody. He'd do a miracle and say, don't tell anybody about this. He healed lepers and he said, just go show yourself to the priest. So you'd be made whole. And a few of them come back and they begin to praise him. He said, but that's not what he wanted. It's not what he desired. He said, but on this day, it was a change. And Jesus began to change. And so as, as he comes in, the multitude starts crying out. They're praising him. They're rejoicing over this triumphant entry of Jesus into the city. And he didn't quiet them down. He didn't say, hey, hey, don't tell anybody. Instead, there was a group of people called the Pharisees. They were standing there watching this whole thing. And by appearance, because if you don't know what a Pharisee is, see, a fair, the difference between a Pharisee and a Sadducee, a Pharisee is their fair, you see. They got it all together. They look good. They look like they're close to Jesus. They have all the T's crossed, all the I's dotted. They, they know it. They got it all right here. But a praiser doesn't praise from here. A praiser praises from here. Yeah. See, because in my brain, man, my world's upside down, but my heart belongs to Jesus. So the Pharisees said to Jesus, hey, you need to tell these people to be quiet. Matter of fact, the text says he should rebuke them strongly. He should get Pastor Jason to tell them bluntly, sit down, shut up. Jesus said, if I tell them to stop praising, you want me to rebuke them, and whatever I rebuke is obedient. So if I rebuke them, praise will stop from them. But praise never stops. He said, because if I rebuke them, they will quiet down. But then the stones, the rocks will recognize that praise has been threatened to stop and they will not allow it. And the stones will cry out. See, and some of you think, oh man, that stuff doesn't have the capacity to hear. Everything in creation has the capacity to hear. Just go read the story of creation in the book of Genesis. God spoke and it obeyed. Everything has the, so the creation recognizes when God's people stop praising him. So the Pharisees said, hey, listen, quiet them down, shut them up, rebuke them, tell them not to, they shouldn't be doing that. This is what, you know, all this has happened. This is prophetic though, because John wrote of Jesus in John 1.11, he said he came to his own and his own did not receive him. And it's a little interesting play on the words in that text, but it, it, the first line where it says he came to his own, that's referring to creation. The word own is referring to creation or his own things or in his domain. The second time in that verse, his own, that is used in that verse isn't talking about creation. It's talking about humanity. He came to his own creation, but humanity would not receive him. See, creation has no problem with him being Lord. Creation has no problem being obedient to him. Creation has no, no problem doing what he says. And every time he commands it, humanity, on the other hand, has a hard time with him being Lord. We have a hard time being obedient. I mean, you look at all the times that creation was obedient. He would speak to wind and it would cease. He would speak to diseases and it'd leave. He'd speak to bread and it would multiply. He'd speak to fish and it would multiply. He'd spoken about another fish and it came up and paid the IRS tax bill. I mean, can you imagine what humanity could have if we would just be obedient to Jesus being the Lord over our lives? Diseases would flee out of our lives. Sickness would flee out. All the things that are going wrong in our lives would flee if we 
would just be obedient. And here it is. Jesus said, listen, they need to keep praising me. If they'll praise me, things will happen. And things haven't changed much in 2,000 years. Creation still will praise God. And so will those people who declared him to be king. However, Pharisees are still alive and amongst us. They, want, they, they don't want people who have received him as king to praise God. They do not want people to praise God. They'll send emails. If you'll kick that person out of the church, I'll stay. If you'll quiet down the 9 o'clock, my family would love to attend your church. If you'll stop the gifts of the Spirit from operating, we'd love to stay. Well, if you throw all that stuff out, are you a church? If we start quieting God's people down, then something else is going to take its place. I tell you that the church ought to be the loudest place on the face of the earth. Heaven's going to be really loud. It's going to be loud with people saying, thank God, I'm home at last. Now, see, we got all kinds of, you can just quiet down over here, quiet down over here. Shh. We'd rather hear Melissa sing. I don't care if you like what I'm singing or not. I ain't singing to you anyway, Michael. <laughs> if you don't know that Bible story, Michael was a historical Pharisee. David, you're the king. People ought not to be seeing you worship God like that. To which his response ought to be your response. I wasn't doing it for you to see anyway, Michael. I was doing it for the king of kings who put me in the place that I'm in today. And I have what I have today because he's my king. So as long as there are praisers, there will always be, always be quieters. And I just find it interesting, and this is cliche, I know, but it's truth. I just find it interesting that you go to football games, you go to baseball games, you go to all these places, you go to concerts, and they're like, get it louder. I'm like, dude, your ears are already bleed. I know, and I love it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, peel the skin off my face and make my hair go back and make it loud. Or... You're driving down the street and the guy pulls up behind you and you're bouncing out of your seat with his bass. I'm like, dude, you got hydraulics on that? He's like, no, dude, I got, I got uh, 312s underneath the seat and it's making me bounce, man. They have no problem. And they, they can get their music as loud as they want. And then when their team gets down, you would think they would quiet down, right? No, no, no. They put their ball caps on inside out, turn them upside down, totally look like a fool. And they think, man, my team's going to respond. Man, and the louder we get, the better our team will play. If you're a Cubs fan, it doesn't work. Okay. We Cardinals are trying it right now, and it doesn't work. And so then their mind is, the louder we get, the more motivated our team will be. We come to church, we're like, the quieter I am, the better they'll sing. The quieter I am, the better he'll preach, which is totally a lie. Because the more you egg me on, the better I preach. The faster I preach, too. Okay? The better they sing. So what we have is everything over here being amplified. All the world stuff being amplified. Their message getting louder and louder. You church people quiet down. You can wear whatever you want, no matter how offensive it is, you can wear it. Just don't wear your Jesus shirt. You can read pornography. You can go whatever you want, but just don't bring your Bible. You can, you can say whatever you want, talk about whatever, just don't talk about Jesus. They don't want praise. They're trying to quiet it down because it is in our praise that our strength comes from. It is in our praise is when we get into the presence of God. And in his presence, there's fullness of joy. And at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. So all of it is an attempt to keep you out of the presence of God. And when you stop praising, you get weak. And isn't it a shame you come to church and be like, I wish you'd quiet that guy down. I'm like, I don't know. I can't control Ed anyway. <laughs> Our boy, Melissa, sure is boisterous. Yeah, she is. But when she gets crazy, it frees me up to worship God too. And we need to be a church of praising people. Because there are people in this room right now 
that need the presence of God in their lives. The scripture says that the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. He lives there. And if this isn't a praying church, then he's not living here. And we need God in this house more than ever before. We need God to move in people's lives more than ever before. We need God to do something in your life more than ever before. And there's a lot of noise, but it's not the right kind of noise. There's all kinds of noise out there telling you that's, that's the way it's going to end for you. That's the way it's always, it's always been. It's always going to be. No, it's not. No, it's not. No, it's not. We need to get back to praising God. So I'm just going to close with this story. And I closed really high at the 9 o'clock. I don't feel that in this service. I feel like God wants to minister right now. Jesus is coming to the city of Jericho. And if you don't know much about Jericho, Jericho was a cursed city. They took a prophet with a cruise of salt to change its future. When Joshua walked around the walls of Jericho, the Bible says that he placed his foot upon those rocks and he said, cursed be the man who rebuilds this city. And if he tries to rebuild this city at the laying of the cornerstone, he'll lose his first son and at the completion of it, he'll lose his second son. And so they went ahead and rebuilt the city. There was a man in the Bible who rebuilt the city. And he, sure enough, he lost two of his sons. And they go get the prophet Elisha. And they bring Elisha. And they say, Elisha, look, the city is pleasant to the sight. It looked like a great place to build. But, but our babies are being stillborn. All these things are happening in our, in our lives because the water is bitter. And Elisha says, go get me a new cruise and put some salt in it. And he takes the salt in the, in the cruise, a new vessel full of salt. It's a covenant inside of a new vessel. And he says, and throw that into the water. And when you throw that into the water, it'll change everything about it. And it did. I think some of you are trying to do the things in God, being the old vessel that you were, and without a new covenant in your life. And God wants to make you a new vessel, and He wants to put a covenant. It's not the covenant of salt. It's the covenant of the Holy Spirit in your life, which will change life forever. He wants to do something like that in your life today. New vessel, new covenant, and it breaks the curse. It breaks the chain off of your life. So there's a guy by the name of Bartimaeus in Mark chapter 10. In Mark, in Mark chapter 10, Bartimaeus is sitting there on the side of the road. And at this time, Jericho is the busiest city in the world. It, it was a place for troop movements. It's a place for trade. All of this hustle, all of this bustle is going on. It's Chicago. It's, I mean, there's, there's so much noise, there's so much stuff going on. It's, and so Bartimaeus, he's blind. And then people always want to, well, why was he blind? Well, Bartimaeus, his name means the son of the unclean one. So more than likely, his parents had something hereditary and they passed it down to him. And he was blind. It was generational. And people always want to qualify. Well, what happened? None of that matters when you get into the presence of Jesus. It doesn't matter how you got it. It matters whether or not Jesus can take care of it. And he can. And so all this noise is happening and Bartimaeus is sitting there. He's blind. And when you're blind, the hearing sense really picks up well. It's trying to overcompensate for you being unable to see. And so all this noise, all this hustle, all this bustle is going on. Everything's going on. And Bartimaeus hears that Jesus is coming to Jericho. Jesus is coming to Jericho. And the name Jesus, you know, is a transliteration of the Jewish name Joshua. And so I'm, I'm sure Bartimaeus, he grew up in a Jewish home, so he knows the story of Joshua. And Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. I know who Joshua is. I mean, Joshua was preceded in his ministry by Moses who prepared them to go into the promised land. And Joshua's ministry began at the Jordan River that when the priest and Joshua stepped into the Jordan River, the waters parted. And so Joshua is coming in and there's going to be, and Joshua came for destruction, but not this Joshua. This Joshua is not coming for destruction. This Joshua is coming for redemption. 
And this Joshua, his ministry also began in the Jordan River, but the waters didn't part. When this guy was in the Jordan River, the heavens parted, and a dove descended, and there was a voice from heaven that said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased in. And Jesus' ministry was preceded by a prophet by the name of John the Baptist, who was out in the wilderness declaring, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And Joshua's greatest day was the day that the sun stood still. And when the sun stood still, oh my goodness, they defeated every enemy the whole day. As long as the sun was up, they're winning the battle. And so Bartimaeus begins to cry out because he realized, hey, the last time there was a victory in Jericho, the people on the last time around, they shouted with their voice and they praised God and the walls fell down. And so he knows that Jesus is coming. He says, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And what do they do? They say, hey, hey Bartimaeus, shut up. Bartimaeus never once referenced his naysayers. He ignored them because he realized that he needed a day like the Joshua of the Old Testament. He needed a day where the sun would stand still. And he cries out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And the sun stopped in front of him. The greatest day of Bartimaeus' life was the day that the sun stood still. And he said, bring that man to me. He's praising me. And as Bartimaeus gets up, Scripture declares that he took off his coat. Not in a dignified manner like I just did. He cast his coat aside. What's so important about that? The coat was what he was holding on to. It identified him as being a blind man. And he knew when he got to Jesus, he wasn't going to be identified by what he was holding on to. He was getting ready to be identified by the one he was running to. And I think there's a lot of you, that you, you you're, you're cloaked in it. You're wrapped in it. It's what identifies you. It, it, it's time to let go of it. I'm not saying to not talk about why you got there. Why I got where I was is because my father died. I'm not going to stop talking about my father, but I'm also not going to talk about being depressed. I'm not going to talk about these things. I'm not going to, talk, I'm not going to be identified by that. I'm going to be identified by the one I'm running to, not by what has tried to wrap itself around my life. And some of you need to take something off today and throw it down. I mean, you're calling on Jesus, but you won't let go of what you're holding on to. You can call on Jesus all you want, but until you let go of it, he won't fix it. Until you let it out of your hand, he can't do anything about it. So if you would, just, just bow your heads. And if you're in this room today, and I feel this so strong right now, there's something that just wrapped itself around your life. Just wrapping itself around you. Wrapping around your emotions. It's wrapping around your mind. It's wrapping around every aspect. And you just can't shake it. Every thought is about that. It's like Bartimaeus. I'm blind. I can't see. I'm blind. I can't see. I'm depressed. I can't get up. I'm, 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 I'm bound. I'm bound. And God wants to loose you today. And he wants to free you today. And the greatest day of your life is when Jesus stops in front of you. And he calls you out. And today he's here. The sun has stood still over your life right here right now and he wants to bring victory into your life and so Heavenly Father across this room and ask for the Holy Spirit just to minister just to minister in the way that only you can minister in every life and in every heart and we would let go of that stop talking about that we start talking about you we begin to praise you for who you are that you're the lifter up of our heads you are a strong tower that the righteous can run into and we're safe that even though my afflictions may, many, may, may be many the scripture says many are the afflictions of the righteous but the Lord delivers them out of them all I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Never seen his seed begging for bread. For the Lord is good. He does wonderful things. And his goodness far outweighs anything you're going through. And he wants to deliver and touch you right now. I ask Lord, that you just touch every life and every heart right now. 
in Jesus' name.